Thank you, Scott. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is John Murphy, uh, or you may know me by my nick. Online is J Winter M. And I've been around Monero since almost the beginning. So I've, this is probably my fifth birthday celebration. Um, and I'm happy to host here today uh, Dave Jevons, I believe, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who is the CEO of CypherTrace, as well as Justin Ehrenhofer, who is at DB Capital. Um, and we're going to talk about Monero and compliance um, for virtual asset service providers, or VASPs. So um, just to get started, I guess, can both of you guys uh, kind of give us an overview of what your company's business is, how compliance factors into that, and, and how you're personally involved in, in keeping your company in compliance with those standards. So uh, I guess sure. if you want to start, Dave. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Dave Jevons, and I'm the CEO of a company called CypherTrace. We are a compliance-oriented uh, company. I got started in crypto in 2011, um, started tracking Bitcoin thefts and how it related to the price of Bitcoin. Um, and then we started CypherTrace in uh, 2015. Um, we help companies, particularly exchanges, to uh, be compliant with anti-money laundering controls. We also help people um, track cryptocurrencies that uh, have been stolen, for example. Um, and we're helping banks as well to evaluate virtual asset service providers to give them banking relationships. So we're working with banks, exchanges, and in some cases, law enforcement to help them uh, recover funds. Um, on the compliance side, I've been doing a lot of work with the emerging regulations, um, and we'll talk about that more today, but uh, that's working with groups like the Financial Action Task Force out of Paris that's setting regulations for most of the developed world. Um, FinCEN, which is the U.S.-based regulator, Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, the Maltese government, uh, the British uh, regulators as well. Okay, you want to jump in, Justin? Cool. Yeah, so I'm going to wear two hats today, effectively. Uh, so on one side, I work for a cryptocurrency OTC trading desk called DV Chain. It is the largest OTC desk for Monero specifically. So if you are looking to trade large amounts of Monero, of course I'm biased, but I recommend going that route. Um, and of course, compliance is critically important for us to be able to understand how to add cryptocurrencies at all and how to handle Monero compliance. So we're very, very interested at remaining in the forefront ahead of that compliance curve. And then also my other hat is the Monero Compliance Work Group, which isn't really a formal work group like the Monero Community Work Group is, like you're watching this uh, YouTube channel uh, uh, or this this uh, on this YouTube channel. But nevertheless, it's still a group of people that are in the Monero community who are interested at in making sure that we're staying up to date at the latest compliance developments in the space and seeing if there's a way for us to help contribute to them to assist really everyone's privacy to make sure that uh, Monero is accounted for in a lot of, the, of these discussions. So yeah, those two parts, one, OTC trading, making sure that compliance is really necessary. And I would argue that because uh, market making firms communicate with a huge number of exchanges, we have a reasonably large degree, like oversight in how compliance is done in the space because we're talking to people about what type of coins they will accept and type and, and things like that all the time. And then uh, the Monero specific work group side, those are more compliance projects, those sorts of things. Okay, so I guess before we, we kind of get into Monero specific um, questions, could you maybe both of you guys give us an overview of, of kind of what guidelines exist. I believe there's there's new FATF guidelines going into effect um, this summer and maybe what kind of existing compliance guidelines are out there kind of generally for the cryptocurrency space. Uh, you want to start? Sure, Dave? I'll take a stab at it. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I'll start with the U.S. and then we'll look about what's happening globally. Um, in the United States, the regulator uh, for cryptocurrencies is a group called FinCEN, the Financial uh, Crimes Enforcement Network. It's part of the Department of Treasury. Uh, they're the people who regulate all the banks, um, the ATM providers, 
money service businesses like PayPal, Western Union. Um, and they have a set of regulations that have been in place for 20 years. They keep upgrading them. So they have guidance. Um, well, it's not just guidance. They actually have real regulations and have done some enforcements in the last few years. In fact, there was a couple of enforcements over the last month or two with some banks who were not being compliant. One of them was banking crypto companies. Um, they have a regulation which is broadly referred to as the travel rule. And they claim that crypto companies should already be compliant with it, but they're giving everyone some leniency because there is no actual, you know, working global solution at this time and people are still working on standards. What the travel rule is, is a regulation that says when you do a payment from a business, so a, an exchange or a trading desk, um, you have to send the customer's name and account number and some other information along with it to the receiver if they are also a business. So this doesn't apply for P2P transactions for you know for me to send you money. Um, it does. It doesn't apply for uh, an exchange to send me money to my personal wallet, but it does matter. It and applies if an exchange sends money to another exchange, and this is across currencies. Now. Globally, there's a group called the Financial Action Task Force, or affectionately known as FATF. Um, it is uh, headquartered in Paris, but it represents about 85% um, of the GDP of the world. So all the G20 are there. In fact, I was in Paris in February for their virtual asset conference, and um, there were 50 companies, countries in that meeting. We had a meeting last week, a video conference, and there were 75 countries on it. They're adopting the same model for the world. So they came out with a document in June of last year, which is risk-based um, approach for virtual currency compliance. And uh, that has the same issue, which we call Reg 16, which is this travel rule uh, thing. And they're effectively saying as of June of this year, they're expecting countries to start adopting that into their local regulations. So FATF is not a regulator, but they set the recommendations for every other regulator in most of the world. Um, Monetary Authority of Singapore is already pushing this. In fact, there is a stricter. Um, uh, Switzerland is pushing it. Um, England is waiting on it until there's a solution out there and a set of standards. Um, so that's generally, in my opinion, what's happening. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to add there, Justin? I mean, Dave kind of covered it pretty broadly there with, you know, around the globe. Just to focus a little bit more on the United States, like, Absolutely, travel rule is something that people are really talking about a lot because no one has a really good working solution yet. So everyone's scrambling to get that together. And then beyond that, I think it's people just relearning how to apply risk-based approaches in a cryptocurrency setting. We've had risk-based uh, based approach guidelines from the FATF and then most regulatory agencies will have their own, like FinCEN has their own set of recommendations. FinTrax is, is one of my favorite to read through. Uh, that's, that's Canada's. And we've already had these implemented for other assets like cash and crypto businesses are sort of new to the game. They don't necessarily have the past history of having these risk-based approaches for other assets that they're applying for cryptocurrencies. So it's in a way sort of new to them, even just because we're in a very startup space rather than banks, which have been doing this forever. So I think a lot of the, uh, a lot of the regulations and sort of compliance related items going in the future will be sort of assuring people that there are generally accepted ways of trying to handle compliance. And that's already happened among many compliant exchanges, but I think some of those areas that are perceived as gray will get better ironed out over time. Okay, um, I guess my my question, building off of that conversation, would be like, what is the current approach towards uh, complying with this travel rule? Like, I mean, when you withdraw money from an exchange, it, there's no way that that exchange, currently, as far as I know, can can know whether your that address you're withdrawing to is is your personal address or is it another business? And if it's another business, then they have to comply with the travel rule, right? So maybe can you guys talk a little bit about the approaches 
that are being developed so that the companies within the United States and around the world can comply with this travel rule? Sure. So I've seen um, a broad based set of two, two approaches. One is private companies trying to build centralized systems um, to basically mimic what SWIFT does for the banks, which is a network that connects all the banks together and has a standard format. Um, this is when you, you know, wire money, you, you, there's a standard network that everybody in the world uses, and there's bank account numbers that is a format that everyone uses. Um, you know, then there's a number of working groups and the working groups are much more focused on building standards to create a decentralized model without a centralized network, um, which facilitates peer to peer exchanges between VASPs. And I've been working on a number of those. I know Justin has, has participated in, in some of these um, events and meetings as well. Um, there's one that I chair called TRISA, the Travel Rule Information Sharing Architecture. Uh, we have a number of VASPs and other companies involved with that, trying to build a standard which solves the problem that you just pointed out, which is how do I know if that's a personal address versus another uh, exchange or, or other cryptocurrency company? Um, that is a big problem. The second problem you have is how do I know if I want to exchange data to that other VASP? Can I trust them? Are they going to protect the customer data? Do they have proper privacy controls? Um, you know, I may not want to send customer data to a, a VASP that I've never heard of in some country that doesn't have strong privacy controls. So these to me are the two big problems. There's a couple of other working groups. One is Open VASP. It's driven by Bitcoin Suisse in uh, Switzerland. Um, we've been working with them. They're trying to come at it with more of a bank account number approach, which I, I'm not a big fan of. Um, I think it changes the whole UI and paradigm of how you send money to people, um, but there's benefits to it. And then there's another group called InterVASP, and there's about 100 companies working on that. And that is simply defining message formats. So what is the content of the messages? It doesn't solve the problem of how do I know if you're a, a VASP or an individual. Do you have anything you want to add there, I, Justin? I, I don't really have anything to add there other than uh, there's those two general types. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, maybe we can pose this question to you first, Justin. Um, since you work at an OTC trading desk, is there anything that you are allowed to comment on um, in terms of how you guys treat transactions for um, cryptocurrencies that have more privacy kind of built in than Bitcoin, for instance, Monero or Zcash? I mean, is there anything specifically that you guys have to do when you're trying to be in compliance when dealing with these more private cryptocurrencies? So I, I think it's important to take a step back and understand what our general compliance needs are when we're receiving deposits of any asset. Whether someone's showing up at our door, we don't do this, but suppose we did accept people showing up at the door with briefcases of cash. How is that different than someone sending us a Bitcoin transaction or someone delivering us an art piece or people sending us a Monero transaction? And to evaluate further, you need to break down how these situations are different from each other. So in Bitcoin's case, we uh, only or well, I guess with everyone we trade with, uh, we only trade with people that we are we are already familiar with. So they have already gone through KYC, AML uh, questionnaires. We have information on them. We're able to communicate that for compliance purposes if that's needed for whatever reason. So we're already, so, so we don't enter a relationship at all unless we already feel really comfortable with who we're trading with. So that's one critically important part. We already know who these people are. We already know what they're doing and why they're trading. So that helps reduce the risk much, much more than if some random person we don't know just shows up with, with a briefcase of cash or whatever. It's, it's, it's a completely different situation. Um, on top of that, though, with, with cryptocurrencies, it's traditional in uh, the industry for those who support cryptocurrencies to have some sort of on-chain analytics tool, whether it's CypherTrace or some others, that will investigate 
the source of funds and it will provide some additional insights on these. Now, there is no direct regulation from FinCEN that says you must always have an on-chain record of all deposits you receive because these AML rules are written for cash. There is no blockchain to look at for cash regulation. So of course, there's gonna be no regulation that says you must have an on-chain record if, if there is no chain. So instead, these tools are used in, in, for transparent assets to help provide better insight um, because this information is available. Uh, it's an additional tool you can use to help uh, satisfy your risk profile. If someone is sending us funds that are related to a mixer and that might not be some behavior that we're expecting, that's some indication that an on-chain tool could help us in understanding we should investigate further. Um, but I will say in general, th there's a big difference from our perspective and, and it's not just from our risk-based approach, but also in how we interact with everyone else in the ecosystem in terms of whether we're dealing with people that use privacy features or people who use privacy products, essentially. So I'm going to call them like Monero or, or Zcash uh, fully shielded, uh, if Zcash fully shielded was, was more widely adopted. So Monero really is the only asset where if someone's sending us Monero, like, they aren't opting into a privacy feature. It's just an inherent feature of the asset. So as a result, it does mean that we tailor uh, the compliance needs a little bit differently. We treat it more similarly to if someone was depositing at us cash. Um, again, someone that we're already very familiar with and why they have this cash and what they're using it for, but we treat it more similarly because it has stronger properties to cash compared to a transparent coin where um, although we're still going through all the AML checks and, and the like, on-chain tools assist in that regard. Um, but, but frankly, we don't want, like, there are so many annoying complications about transparent coins from our market-making perspective where we might accept coins that we're very comfortable with the counterparty with and we've done a ton of due diligence, diligence with them. Well, if we're going to send those coins to an exchange, all that context is lost. So then we have to go through a really arduous compliance process trying to communicate with these exchanges. And so it's actually really, really difficult when it's a non-fungible asset. But I think I'm, I'm sort of getting into a different, a different question here. So I'll pass it along to Dave. Well, I think, um, you know, right now what we've seen is, uh, I think Justin points out, if you know who your customer is and they receive funds or send funds, you're generally fine. You've complied with your AML and KYC obligations as they exist today, although FinCEN would disagree. Um, I think on this, I mean, we can just talk in general about uh, this travel rule thing because it is, um, it is designed to be chain agnostic. So think of it as an out of band communication and discovery mechanism. Um, some of the issues that we see is are um, how do you find out if that counterparty you do need to send that information to? Uh, I think there's a lot of concern on my side about privacy implications of this, you know, spewing customer data all around the world to people who you don't know who it is. Uh, I think there's unintended consequences about for maybe not for Monero, but for other assets. Um, if I know the person's name and address, and then I know some of their their cryptocurrency addresses, I can start to figure out how much wealth they actually have, which is very different from in banking. If I send you a thousand euros, uh, all you know is I sent you a thousand euros in my name. You can't figure out my bank balance. So, um, you know, one of the benefits of of Monero is uh, you won't necessarily be able to figure that out. Um, not so true with. Uh, with other assets like Bitcoin, where you can, in many cases, figure out uh, how much a person is actually worth. So these are the types of issues we're trying to surface to these these um, government agencies to try to show them that perhaps this approach that they're taking is a bit old school, taking the old banking network and trying to slap it on crypto because that's all they know. Um, and they don't understand the risks. And also, I'm not sure it actually solves anything. I think it creates a lot more problems than it solves. But I will say this, that there's, a, there's about a dozen people in the world who show up for these meetings, and it's all the same people um, from private industry, from these working groups. Um, and if those people weren't showing up in Paris and in Japan and on these webinars and in Vienna, um, these government guys would regulate us out of existence.
because they just don't understand. So there's a lot of education to be done to these folks around, is this really the right way to approach it? And um, how does this work for more privacy oriented um, assets? And not only just that, what are the risks of these things that they're trying to push? Okay, um, I guess with that in mind, um, I don't know if either of you guys have any particular insights, but I'm sure you've both heard and the folks listening that, that Monero was recently delisted from some Korean exchanges. And I don't think an explicit reason was really given, but I think the kind of subtext was that it was related to being in compliance with some um, regulation, whether that, I, I mean, assuming that comes from the South Korean government. And then also I think last summer or so Zcash was, was delisted from Coinbase in the UK. And again, I don't know that an explicit reason was given, but I was just wondering if either of you guys can comment on those types of events happening for these more privacy oriented coins and how that fits in with the compliance picture. Well, I can take a first swag at it. Um, I think there's a difference between trading an asset and allowing people to transfer it in and out. And I think, I think is where people are getting uh, a little confused here. Um, there's exchanges that allow you to buy and sell Zcash off your account and trade it, but they won't let you send it in and out natively. They're concerned about uh, potential enforcement actions. Um, I think you see the same thing in Japan where they're actually listing currencies that you're allowed to trade and ones that you're not. Um, I'm not sure a blacklist approach is really the right way because there'll always be more currencies. Um, but they're trying to take that sort of heavy handed approach. Um, I think you're going to see the same thing in Singapore shortly because monetary authority of Singapore is starting to crack down uh, pretty hard um, and relatively quickly and has um, taken these measures further than uh, some of these other countries. Um, I'm not sure about why, uh, why it was delisted at Coinbase in the UK because um, FCA has to this date really not done any enforcement. In fact, a year and a half ago, they didn't know what cryptocurrencies were. So they, I mean, literally I went to go brief them and they didn't, they had no idea. And I was in a room with, you know, 20 people. Uh, they barely understood it. Um, and so, you know, they've had to come up on a fairly steep learning curve. And, um, you know, right now they're punting on some of this regulations, but they are getting pressure to do it. Um, so Justin. I can give a little bit of insight on the South Korean recent issue. So that there was this real recent heinous act that someone committed. They were doing very, very illegal things and they were accepting cryptocurrency payment for them. And I think as a result, the exchanges that are in South Korea were, were really worried about public opinion. Public opinion turned very strongly against uh, not only just cryptocurrencies, but also uh, more hatred of Monero than other cryptocurrencies proportionally, uh, just because it was mentioned in a few news reports. So uh, it, it's still an ongoing process. One exchange chose to delist, another exchange chose to temporarily add a, a warning and are going to reevaluate in a few weeks time. So that's still a very much ongoing matter, but I think it's, my current understanding is that it's been done mostly a, an abundance of caution from public perception perspective, rather than a direct compliance perspective, but also South Korea has some other cryptocurrency regulations that are less favorable than, than the United States, for example. So I think it will be a while to, to really know what this will actually play out to look like. Okay, uh, we're coming up towards the end and we have a couple questions in chat. So, but before we get to them real quick, I just was wondering if you guys can share a little bit about like what do you really enjoy about the work that you do and if you have any funny anecdotes or, or anything you can share about uh, where coins came from or any kind of compliance <laughs> silly stories or anything. Um, you want to start Justin? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I guess one thing that I think is kind of funny is like in the Monero community, we talk about BISC, the decentralized exchange pretty often. So I've, I'm always curious, like what coins are people actually trading on this network? So I, I've gone through and investigated what coins were actually in the order book uh, on BISC before. And I would say about 75% were tainted in a way that like 
most exchanges wouldn't want to touch them. They're associated typically indirect, but there's a ton of mixing exposure. So it's, it's really common for people to go to like Wasabi mix and then trade it on BISC or, or vice versa. That's super common. And it's, it's increasingly common for cryptocurrency exchanges to start flagging mixing related activities. So I thought that was pretty interesting. But the, I, the really interesting thing part is that uh, this isn't really an avoidable problem because BISC is based on Bitcoin transactions. So you're always going to know one way or another what the related Bitcoin transaction is. And then you're going to be able to run it through a tool to figure out some of the, the background information on it. So what the BISC team did is uh, they used to have an API that provided the Bitcoin addresses um, and they just removed the Bitcoin address component out of the API. So you can no longer query BISC to figure out like what the, what the Bitcoin addresses are directly to do that type of work. But you can always make your own client, uh, like what the person did with a recent hack where they stole a bunch of funds. They made a, their own BISC client to steal funds. Well, in this case, you would just make your own client to pull out the actual Bitcoin addresses related to these trans, uh, these orders. So I, that, that's one pretty funny uh, sort of Monero related uh, activity, just because I know the Monero to Bitcoin pair is, is the most traded pair there. Um, it's just something I looked into and was, was kind of, kind of thought was really, really funny that uh, that feature was just sort of pulled um, because they realized people were looking at it. <laughs> Uh, my story before you, yeah, oh, go ahead. Go my ahead. story's not that funny, but I just, I just love this business. I've loved crypto since 2000. In fact, 1999, when the cypherpunk groups would get together, uh, first Tuesday of every month in Palo Alto for Chinese food and try to figure out how to build a, a cryptocurrency digital cash system. Um, I went to Anguilla in 2000 at the financial cryptography conference, which I would recommend people look into. It's every February once travel comes back. It's always in the Caribbean in a um, in a tax friendly jurisdiction. But I got to meet the digi uh, the um, e gold guys uh, five years before they were indicted for not doing KYC. Um, I got to meet the um, zero knowledge folks from Montreal who really started building out the first zero knowledge systems. Um, primarily at that time, it was more for Tor-like networks, but it's the same stuff that underlines Zcash. Um, got to meet the DigiGold guys and um, David Chaum and all those folks. So when Bitcoin came around, I was like, yay, finally, we figured out the issue of how do you get to ground, meaning how do you get cash in and out of the system without having to rely directly on banks? And that's a huge innovation for me. So it was just interesting to see how things you know, have evolved over time. Um, I think Monero is a dream project. I just hope that these regulations, you know, don't break it. So building on that a little bit, uh, the one question that the, the YouTube chatters seem to want to hear an answer to from you, Dave, is I guess at a uh, AML and financial investigation workshop, uh, Pamela Clegg, who is a, a um, staff at CypherTrace, made a comment about how Monero had dropped out of the top 10 and thank goodness. And they were just curious, do you guys see Monero as, as kind of a threat to your business model? And, or do you have, um, maybe you can share any plans on, on doing kind of cipher tracing on the Monero network? Or are you guys, I mean, I, I, that's probably pro proprietary, but. If uh, you know, well, no, it's, it's not on proprietary. That. So I think, you know, people ask us, is Monero the biggest crime unit out there? And is it, is it used for that? And our answer is definitely not, um, you know, we do a lot of work in dark markets, mixers, etc. Uh, Bitcoin is the number one king of the realm. Uh, now it may get moved in and out of Monero at different points, but um, you know, cash is the biggest way that people launder money today, and or banks that don't do their obligations. Um, so I think people need to keep that in perspective, and I think it's important that people are able to make P2P transactions in an anonymous, untraceable fashion. And I think everyone would agree with that. There's a place in the world for digital cash; it's needed. Um, you have to be able to make those transactions privately. Uh, as far as um, Monero projects, um, it is public knowledge um, that we do have a project that is funded by Homeland Security to do research into um, Monero. Um, so that's all I'll say about that. Um, as we all know, it's a, you know, it's a challenging space, but we're also studying all the academic papers um, that are out there doing some original research in it. Um, yeah. 
Okay, cool. Well, thank you guys so much for taking the time this morning to uh, share some insights on on something that probably, you know, I, I think everyone watching the chat is deeply involved in in cryptocurrency space, and it's probably an aspect that most of us don't really think about too much. So, thank you guys for coming on, uh, and happy birthday to Monero. Happy birthday to Monero. <laughs> I think Justin's taking over. Yeah, Justin's taking yeah. over for the next event, I think.